there is a class action lawsuit against a period product company called Thinks. Welcome back to Beyond the Bedroom. I'm Perna, I'm a sex educator, and I work in sexual and reproductive public health. And today, I'm talking about something that's really been buzzing in media lately. So if you get a period and you live in the United States, you have probably gotten some marketing from this company before. Uh, they were considered kind of the biggest period underwear company. They were, had these reusable uh, menstrual products. They were like a really big deal. So like I said, I am finishing up my master's in public health. My concentration is in reproductive and sexual public health. But before I even started grad school, I was a sex educator. I have my Bachelor of Science and I really love uh, reproductive biology. That's like my focus. And so when this came up, it was really interesting for me to go back through my notes and read about PFAS, uh, which I'll get to, uh, but also to be able to talk about it because this is kind of a more nerdy subject than I'm used to tackling here. And um, sometimes I do like to nerd out and talk a little bit more about biology and chemistry. But because of my interest, these headlines really got my attention. I used to wear Thinx. I actually was in an advertisement for Thinx once uh, a couple years back. I did a Mother's Day ad with them, with my mom. Uh, so this was actually really surprising to me. And also I have some experience um, having a reproductive toxicologist as a professor who gave a really great lecture one day about this. Um, it was really kind of weird timing for me to, to have this lawsuit pop up. So here's what we know and what we don't know. And spoiler, there's so much we don't know. But that's exciting for me, and I hope it doesn't make you scared. And I'm going to explain to you also why it's okay to be cautious without going overboard and what the dangers of that could be. I also want to just say another disclaimer. Although I have talked about things in the past and I have endorsed them um, and I wasn't an advertisement for them, I have no financial ties to that company. I don't owe them anything. I'm going in this totally unbiased. So Thinks claimed that their products were non-toxic and sustainable. And an independent investigation, actually a few, showed that their materials contain PFAS. So what are PFAS and why are they so bad? And did Thinks purposely mislead customers? So the lawsuits are actually not about the materials themselves. This is something that's been there's been a lot of bad takes about, and there's been a lot of bad health reporting, I could say. Uh, the lawsuit itself is actually about the language used in its advertising and marketing of the products. So it's not about if there's PFAS in it and if they're harmful, it's about the, the words non-toxic and sustainable and how that relates to the chemicals found in the materials. So PFAS, P-F-A-S, I like to call them PFAS for short. They stand for per and polyfluorical substances. Some people tend to say polyfluorinated chemicals, but uh, for the sake of consistency, we're gonna just shorten it to P-F-A-S, per and polyfluorical substances. So the OECD defines it as a fluorinated substances that contain at least one fully fluorinated methyl or methylene carbon atom, for my fellow chemistry nerds out there, you guys, <laughs> you guys know this definition already, but um, that is with a few noted exceptions. So any chemical with at least a perfluorinated methyl group, which is, um, I'll just put it in, in the video, or a perfluorinated methylene group is a PFAS. Basically, long story short, it's a chemical with extra fluorine. And we know that fluorine itself is an irritant, but the chemical makeup of PFAS are not that simple, unfortunately. And this might sound complex, but in reality, we are all very familiar with PFAS. They're in our pizza boxes and our takeout containers and our weatherproof jackets and our floor mats in our cars. Anything that is waterproof or greaseproof is likely to contain some sort of PFAS. And they can also act as a fire retardant or make things slippery. So they're used a lot in manufacturing and a lot of products that we use. There's also two types. So there's short chain and long chain PFAS. 
Um, and that's based on whether or not it has more or less uh, than eight carbon atoms, which doesn't really matter in the context of this. Just for us to understand, the long chain ones, so the ones that have uh, more than eight carbon atoms, those are the ones that are called forever chemicals. You might have heard that term before. It's thrown around a lot. Um, People also tend to use it interchangeably as endocrine disruptors, but those are actually different. Those are two different phrases. So forever chemicals are the long chain PFAS. That's what we tend to call them because once they have entered our environment, they just don't break down. The short chain substances are really becoming more popular as they're replacing the long chain ones. So these chemicals have been used since the 1940s and they're, as I said, in a lot of different things that we use. So there is some evidence that they pose health risks and uh, it's not as simple as saying all PFAS do this. So things, again, like dental floss, shampoo, carpeting, this all can contain a type of, of this type of substance. Even things that we use uh, in life-saving measures like firefighting foam or waterproof clothing can contain them as well. So why are we calling them forever chemicals? So as you can imagine, something that's waterproof or greaseproof does not break down easily and they don't really erode. And according to the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States, they are pretty present pretty much everywhere. So they're in our water, our air, our soil, our food, in, in our materials that build our homes and that we put on our bodies. PFAS have even been found on both poles. Yeah, even in like Antarctica, this stuff has been found. But remember, don't panic because we don't necessarily know what all 9,000 types of PFAS directly do to our bodies. And technically speaking, everything is a chemical. So when people are saying chemical free, it's just not an accurate description. I'm, I'm in the camp that's like the dose creates the poison, but in the term, in terms of PFAS, you know, they could build up, uh, they do build up in our environment, but our bodies break down things differently than the environment around us does. Uh, we have organs in place to break down and detoxify our, our environmental pollutants. That doesn't mean that this stuff is like completely clear, but it also doesn't necessarily mean we know exactly what it does to our bodies. So like our kidneys, liver, skin gets rid of a lot of it and our blood does too. So Interestingly, menstruation is a great way for our bodies to get rid of these substances. So menstruators rejoice, finally a nice uh, reason to get your period, right? So there are two types of PFAS that are especially resistant to breaking down. It's the PFOS and the PFOA, and they've been banned in the US. So these types of PFAS that were found in thinks were not part of the camp that was banned in the United States. So I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear on that. Thinks technically did not do anything illegal in its manufacturing. It comes down to the claims and the language used in the products and the marketing of the products and if they misled customers. And I want to take a moment also to say that scientific language is precise on purpose, right? So we can say that there might be an association with PFAS and thyroid disease or immune suppression. We can see a growing body of evidence supporting that PFAS, they might be linked to immune suppression. We can't say oh, PFAS are directly linked to thyroid disease or immune suppression, just because it's not that simple, unfortunately. We're still seeing a growing body of evidence relating some types of the 9,000 different types of PFAS being linked to immune suppression, but it's mostly in those uh, exposed through manufacturing or through water and soil, and not necessarily to people that have garment uh, exposure. So it's also like how you're exposed, how much of it you're exposed to, what uh, time period you were exposed to it, and which type you were exposed to. So I know this because I am a community sex educator. People hear association and they panic. 
and I understand why. When we use the term association in science, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a direct link, that you do this and this will be the outcome. It mostly means we see a pattern here. We see some sort of correspondence between these two things. It's not necessarily correlating to it, and it's not necessarily causation either, but an association could mean a lot of different things, and for the most part, it means we need to research this a little bit more, or a lot more. To be honest, this is why I've been really disappointed in a lot of the reporting of this trial. Because people will say, thinks used harmful chemicals knowingly, or they misled customers knowingly. And it's so easy to jump to that, but I want to take a step back to really inform people, what are we talking about? What is the harmful chemical? What does it really do? what's the chance that they misled us? And maybe they did. Maybe they did do this on purpose. We don't know yet. This this lawsuit is still ongoing. It did settle, but there are fallouts coming out of it because it is a class action lawsuit and there has to be claims filed. But I will say this, non-toxic is not an actual scientific term. It's a marketing ploy. Again, in the case of period underwear, you could be using materials to make them waterproof. Um, and then calling them non-toxic because the maybe the layer that's closest to your vulva. You could maybe argue, again, just thinking about how these things are portrayed, you could argue that since that is not closest to your body, it could be non-toxic. But is that misleading customers because they expect the entire product to support and uphold those claims? This is the type of thing that this lawsuit was really getting into. There are a lot of products that use labels like eco or eco-friendly, environmentally sustainable, organic, or non-toxic, and they all contain PFAS. Even cookware that's labeled as non-toxic, if it has some sort of non-stick capability, it's probably containing PFAS. And it's not like there's ingredients listed for anything that we buy that isn't directly ingestible, right? So it's a marketing ploy, and unfortunately, it's there's no backing up uh there's no there's no way to back up that term so it's kind of a red flag to me when brands use the term non-toxic i tend to kind of look at them with a magnifying glass a little bit because i'm saying what what are the values that they're pushing here what is the point of saying this is non-toxic who are they trying to reach and trying to persuade with this and how can they back up these claims and what claims are they even making so you know a lot of people though don't even know that that's a thing i mean i did not know the difference between uh short and long chain pfas until grad school i mean i was just really lucky i had a great professor who literally wrote a book on like fetal toxicity so it's not necessarily like everyone knows what all these chemicals do and then they manufacture something and say oh we're gonna lie it's just become such a popular term and it's so easy to use it that's the thing that is being um represented here. And I mentioned this earlier, but the phrase endocrine disruptors is thrown around a lot, especially like in crunchy spaces where they will say these products are toxic and they're endocrine disruptors. Don't buy them. Um, but then those same people are pushing products that have high levels of heavy metals, essential oils that are not sourced properly no evidence or supporting of their claims of non-toxic. The moral of the story here is that a lot more companies should have their claims of non-toxic investigated, and we should get rid of this phrase altogether. PFAS have been found everywhere, so at this point, can we really say that something is non-toxic completely if it involves a manufacturing process that contributes to more PFAS in the environment? I mean, it's hard to say. We also don't necessarily know exactly what all of these chemicals do to us, so that's also hard to say. Do you see why reproductive public health is kind of tricky sometimes? Because <laughs> we just don't know. There's a lot we just don't know. So why do I say don't panic? Well, because I want you to exercise caution without entering a space where you as an individual who is vulnerable to uh, the kind of what I call big natural, which is what I explained earlier, like somebody who says, 
all of these companies are toxic and they're out to get you. So you need to buy from us instead. And it's just the same thing over and over. So when I say don't panic, it means think for yourself and also get more familiar with what these chemicals are and what they could lead to without going from zero to 60. The truth is the evidence we can't say for sure, but it's good to exercise caution, definitely. So there was a 2022 study that I read. I have it open right now. So dermal uptake, an important pathway of human exposure to perfluorical substances, question mark, and shout out, there is an Icelander in the title, uh, in the uh, authors here. Her name is Otni Ragnarsdottir. So um, I'll link you, I'll put the DOI and everything. Uh, but it came out in May of last year and it talks about PFAS that have been produced and um, has been in a broad range of products, they say since the 50s. They talk about the dermal absorption potential, which is like, especially in this case, like the vulva is more absorbent than other parts of the body. But they're, the jury is still out, pun intended, <laughs> talking about a lawsuit um, about the implications for dermal exposure to PFAS. So that's a really good one if you want to get familiar with it. Um, but basically what I'm saying is if you're worried about PFAS exposure and thinks you've already been exposed to them and you will continue to be exposed to them after you toss your pair, that doesn't mean keep them. I mean, I personally think thinks should be, and they are doing better to reduce the uh, levels in, in their clothing. But remember also that, and I'm going to try to word this carefully, it is important to think about how menstrual product toxicity is reported on differently than a lot of other industries, a lot of other products, and kind of keep that in mind too. So here's like the nitty gritty on what happened. So in 2020, a person named Jessane Choi did an independent investigation on several pairs of Thinks. So um, they sent them to a lab at the University of Notre Dame, and they, uh, that lab found that the underwear did contain these substances. The CEO of Thinks at the time, Maria Molland, released a statement after Choi reported on her findings in Sierra Magazine. Molland said that the company had a toxicologist review the findings and confirmed there were no detectable long-chain PFAS chemicals in their products. So that's like an important little facet there, right? A lawsuit ensues. And it's not just Jessane Choi that has a claim to make, right? There are allegations that this statement, especially the follow-up statement that Molland put out, it misrepresented the testing and results and continued to mislead customers and consumers. So another person named Nicole Dickens filed a claim, filed the first claim in New York. And she also sought out third-party testing, and they found short-chain PFAS. So the lawsuit, again, isn't about the health risks associated with PFAS, but it is about the language. And that is what is so important, and I really hope will change in the future. And I personally do think that things should have been more clear. Um, the public is not well informed about what PFAS are, what they do, what they might do, what they might not do, how they affect us, how we absorb them, who is most at risk, etc. And how we even get rid of them in our bodies, right? Which is so interesting that this is a menstrual product company and the, a huge way that women get rid of this chemical is through menstruation. It's a great way to get rid of a lot of um, this substance. So even if you go out and get a blood test that confirms that you have been exposed to PFAS, we don't even know what that means. We don't necessarily, we can't tell you, oh, that means like you have a higher risk of this. We just know the association is there, but we don't know what causes it, what levels cause it, how it happens. We can't say for certain. Um, even the CDC says if you think that you've been at risk for this exposure, especially in like manufacturing, you can go talk to your doctor, get a blood test, but even if it, the results confirm it, we're unsure basically of how to move forward. We still don't fully understand what the direct consequences are. So that's another reason I say don't panic because we can't be certain, which sounds counterintuitive, but when you look at it from a scientific perspective, 
sometimes it's better to proceed with caution instead of blowing everything up because then you start to get paranoid about everything. And I think it's smart to be cautious about brands that are so adamant about using the word non-toxic because it's just not a scientific term. So unlike something like asbestos exposure leading to mesothelioma, we can see that direct link. There isn't that direct link with PFAS and health issues. We have seen evidence supporting an association, but that's not enough, unfortunately. And I look forward to the day that we do understand exactly how this chemical um, might or might not change things in our body and lead to adverse health outcomes. Um, but we're not there yet. But hopefully stuff like this, this lawsuit, will contribute to the funding of that research because I do think it's important for us to understand, especially when it comes to reproductive health and fetal development especially too. And this is a class action lawsuit. So if you bought a pair of Thinks between November 12th, 2016 and November 28th, 2022, you can submit a claim before mid-April and get reimbursed for up to three pairs. I think it's like $7 each or something, or a voucher for a discount. I think it's like 35% for, for a discount. I mean, <laughs> I have had uh, a lot of pairs of things. Um, I got it. I got most of my pairs for free anyway. So I personally um, am not going to submit a claim because I'm like $7 each. Like, what's the point, you know? But I do think that that is a good option for people who do feel impacted by this lawsuit. Um, but I would definitely recommend understanding what is happening at a scientific level. I always talk about this all the time about how knowledge really is power. And it sounds so cheesy and so cliche. But if you're somebody who is reading these headlines and you know what PFAS are, you know how they're made, you know what they do to our environment or how they linger in our environment, you understand the growing body of evidence and you can think critically about how you digest that material and what it means to you, you're going to be a lot more well-informed than somebody who just does unfortunately not have uh, that type of background and hear someone go, this company misled you and they are toxic and they're out to get you. They're all out to get us. Like it can be a really slippery slope and that is really unhealthy mentally. And I think a lot of people can get really anxious and of course it's infuriating and it's anxiety provoking. Don't get me wrong. I'm not invalidating any of those feelings, but that can create momentum for another uh, kind of movement to say, but we don't do that. We don't have products like that. And then you get sold a lot of different things that are like, we can reverse the damage that these companies did. We can cleanse and detox your body for you. Um, we have products to detoxify your heavy metals and things like that, which unfortunately we know don't work. And um, we know what does work and it's not... It's not a lot of the stuff that is out there on the internet. Also, I just want to say, unfortunately, um, per usual, the most marginalized in our society are the most at risk. And I think that's something to really also mention here is that it's the people that are in the manufacturing. It's the people who are in con areas with contaminated water supply. I mean, this, this whole thing is also coming out around the time um, a couple weeks ago, the big train collision in East Palestine, Ohio, um, it is infuriating sometimes when you think about how, you know, what was it like a stock buyback that was part of the decision, you know, it's like it's cheaper to let these trains crash than to make these changes. And that is really infuriating and, and that breaks my heart. But I do believe that the consumer should have more power and do I believe that more should be done absolutely do I think that everyone who's worn thinks is immediately now at risk for an adverse health outcome I I don't think so you know there's also a lot of other things that you have worn and a lot of other things that you've been exposed to with these chemicals in them so it, it it's almost impossible to say it would only be because of this however do I think we should throw out the term non-toxic? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to be more specific. What is in this garment? How is it made? 
we need more transparency. I think that is really the power of the consumer today is that people are saying, how was this made? How do you treat your garment workers also? What risks are they exposed to? Um, I mean, unfortunately, that's not really a priority for everybody. The language that is being used to market products, it's on both sides, you know? And I'm, I'm also happy that sustainable, like sustainability efforts are being questioned as well. Um, if something does not break down in the environment, how sustainable could it really be? That's something for us to consider as well. And unfortunately, there's a gap here for people who aren't corporations and are just independent people saying this product of mine is non-toxic and they're selling it from their Etsy store. It's like, it's not just at the top. It's really like a, a societal thing. I personally think that more children really need to be taught about biology and chemistry in a way that's palatable for them with the context. You will use this stuff later in life. You will, if you understand chemistry, you're going to understand what's going on when this type of stuff happens in society. We're moving into an era, um, environmentally speaking, like in, in terms of climate activism, we're moving into an era that if you understand chemical makeup in our environment, you are going to be able to think more critically about the uh, decision. And you're also going to be able to criticize appropriately the corporations that are cutting corners, the corporations that are choosing to possibly expose people to adverse health outcomes or pollutants. Um, not saying that thinks is, I'm just saying in general, like moving forward, I would like to see more, more companies held accountable. That being said, this is not necessarily about what PFAS do to us, but rather, let's stop using this language. Like, I really think more brands should be going through their text on their website with a fine tooth comb because if you are making claims like this and you expect people to understand the ins and outs of the manufacturing of your product, that's really willfully ignorant, I would say. It's hard for me sometimes to talk about these things because people will expect me to take a side there's kind of two sides to this and i'm not on either end of it i'm i'm a secret third thing <laughs> but unfortunately and i think this is a bigger commentary as well i can't post on tiktok about like hey guys don't panic like this is what's happening because one it just probably won't reach as many people as if i was like this company is trying to render you infertile like that would blow up and people would be like oh my god because like it's a shock value like that people know that that's what gets the views and sells the products and gets the clicks right that's another part of this that is really unfortunate and it really does bother me like health bad health reporting is my biggest pet peeve if you are also like reporting on something and willingly and willfully misleading the readers jail straight to jail um i really i really don't respect that um i believe that people are smarter like the public is way smarter than we think it is um and i'm included in that i'm part of the public and sometimes i'm sometimes the reporter i'm support sometimes the person being reported to in both cases um I want to be fair and as a health correspondent I want to talk to people about this stuff and break it down. It bothers me I think the most that people are being taken advantage of on both sides of this, right? Both like the consumer, um, well, you know, like technically it is non-toxic because blah blah blah. People don't know always what that means. Um, but on, on the other hand it's like if the evidence really isn't there for the type of health outcome that people are saying is there, it really is a tricky place to be in. And I think this is an uncomfortable place for a lot of people to sit in, right? As a consumer, you want to know what to do and you want to know how to move forward and be able to trust the products that are being marketed to you to uphold the claims. But if the claim itself is this vague phrase that is not scientifically backed it's really anything goes right so i think that it is a good thing that we're seeing a shift away from like the greenwashing the eco-friendly non-toxic language and we're as consumers starting to say what does that mean can you break that down for us 
and partnered also with the ability of social media to engage people on this i think it is important to tread carefully so that we don't sensationalize what's happening here and i would really really love to see more people actually be educated on the biological things going on here i would love for people to understand how these chemicals can exist in the environment and our bodies might handle it differently than our environmental um, effects. And that's something that's a bigger task and something that I feel like I'm tasked with. But, you know, I think it's a good, you know, I think it's a good fight. Unfortunately, there's a lot more companies that use these terms that aren't being looked at and they use terms like non-toxic even though they have higher levels of PFAS in them. So maybe this will be a domino effect, but I doubt it. I mean, I think it will mostly stay within the menstrual product industry. Um, but I mean, you never know. I mean, I would like to see this, for example, um, we kind of go through a fine tooth comb here about what language is used for sex toys, um, things like that. I mean, I think that's kind of the next frontier. Uh, people also, a lot of the time, will... Uh, hear stuff like this and then still buy like a jelly dildo and I'm like that is so that's actually we know that that's toxic for you we know that that does something to you so please don't do that um so that's why I say a lot like it's important how we report this stuff um because you know the public is counting on people like me to be truthful and that's why it really irritates me when people that are reporters and don't necessarily have the health background are considered health correspondents because they're maybe reporting on something that just isn't credible and then it scares the public and then the public like there's individuals in there that are rocked to the other side and just kind of get marketed to from another side of it and it's like it's just an endless cycle and I know like I can't and I'm not expecting to like save everyone from that but I think we could definitely lessen the effects of it and start to kind of identify what is misinformation and what isn't when we stopped sensationalizing stories like this that's my two cents this podcast <laughs> went into a different direction than a lot of people might have expected but um I think it's really important to think about these things and have an open conversation about it and sometimes take a step back and be like wait what is going on what are these things that people are talking about how do they affect my body um and I would also think that being able to have um media literacy is like this is why I teach media literacy as a part of my sex ed. I'm not kidding. Like it is such a crucial point uh, for me, especially with adolescent sexual education. I talk about not just like media literacy in terms of sexual content, but also in terms of uh, health reporting. How do we do we all know how to read a research paper? Do we all know um, how to access those things? When someone goes do your research, it's often a cop out. So do we know how to proceed with a conversation that ends that way? It's one of those things that I really drive home and I and I make sure I tell them that chemistry and biology are actually a big part of sex ed and reproductive health. So you better brush up on those things because they can be important to your sex life and not in terms of like getting young kids to be interested in biology because it has to do with sex, but because it's creating kind of that tangible like, oh, that's my real life like use of this stuff that I'm learning. And that can be kind of fun and cool too. So um, I'm seeing a lot of great reporting on this, but I'm seeing a lot of bad reporting on it too. Um, I know Dr. Jen Gunter um, did a re really great article on her Substack about uh, she said, should I be worried about toxic chemicals and thinks what we know and more importantly, what we don't. That's funny. That's like kind of exactly what I'm saying here. She, um, did a really great article on her Substack. I really recommend it. And then I'm also quoting here the NPR article that I, I really love, um, the way they reported it as well. It's by Rachel Treisman. Put both of those articles and also the, the uh, research article that I mentioned earlier in the show notes for this. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you learned something. I hope that we're able to think critically about this stuff. And uh, if you got a pair of things, submit a claim, see what happens. And let me know, how did it go? Was the process easy? Because that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in too. Was the process easy? Was it difficult? Um, and I'll do a little follow-up to this uh, at the end of uh, 
probably April or May with how the lawsuit, the class action lawsuit um, ended. The settlement, for example, thinks said that they um, basically they were saying like it doesn't mean that they were like guilty or, or whatever. It says thinks will also take steps to ensure that PFAS are not intentionally added to its underwear at any stage of production and adjust some of its marketing language, including disclosing the use of antimicrobial treatments. It will continue to have suppliers of raw materials sign a code of contact and agreement attesting that PFAS are not being intentionally added to Thinks underwear. We could all afford to uh, move forward with more pressure on more companies to do this, but at the same time, I need to see more direct linkage, um, especially in terms of like endocrine disruption. So there's uh, not just two sides to every argument. There's lots and lots more. So I think um, it's interesting to see what the fallout will be for this. But again, thank you for listening. Um, what are your thoughts about the Thinks lawsuit? How do you feel about it? Were you a Thinks user like me? And um, is it? do you find it weird that I'm not panicking? <laughs> um, I would love to know your thoughts. You can leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching. Um, if you're listening, leave a comment on my Instagram or email me at bbsexed at gmail.com. If you have a question, sex ed related or reproductive health related, email it to me. I'm collecting for more mailbag episodes. So ask me something about sex toys or your sex life or your period or fertility or whatever. At this point, ask me something about chemistry. I would love that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day or night wherever you are from here in Washington, DC in my bedroom. Um, I hope you have a good one.